Now that we have calculated many of our descriptive statistics for multiple regression, let's talk about making inferences, starting with the validity of inference and the conditions that we must have in order to have valid inferences. We always, anytime we need to make inferences, we always need to have some conditions met for valid inference, so we should talk about those and talk about how to check for those. I say here that certain conditions must be met for confidence intervals to be valid, but indeed that goes beyond confidence intervals. If we're just doing a hypothesis test, of course, we also need those conditions for valid inference. Confidence intervals are simply a series of hypotheses test, so the same conditions are necessary even if we're just doing a single hypothesis test, and we'll actually look at both confidence intervals and hypothesis testing once we've established the conditions for valid inference. The conditions are based on data collection and properties of the data that can be examined graphically. The unfortunate thing about any of the conditions for valid inference, and that's not just with multiple regression, that's with any time we're looking at conditions, those conditions are about the population of data. That is the very thing that we want to make an inference about. We're actually assuming some things about the distributions of that population. So when we look at our data, we're using that as an approximation of what we would hope to see if we were looking at the population. So obviously, the larger the data set, the more confident we can be about meeting the conditions for valid inference. The smaller the data set, the more we may have to make some hand-waving gestures as we talk about valid inference to make sure that um, that we understand that we're perhaps taking a little bit of a risk, but I would say not a big risk from the standpoint that we're still going to get uh, good information, even if our confidence intervals aren't exactly right, and they never are exactly right, even if our p-values are exactly right and they're never exactly right, what we're trying to do is obtain more information than we had before based upon making observations and making observations from a sample drawn from a population. So let's look at these five bullets that I have here for these conditions. First is independence of observations. The easiest way to make sure that we have independence of observations is to incorporate into the design that we are going to be observing individuals independently. If we could take a random selection of observations and observe each of those without overlap when we're measuring, that will give us good independence. There are some times when independence is a little bit more tricky if, for instance, we're doing any sort of longitudinal data collection. You might have what is called a serial correlation. That is, we have subsequent data points somehow being correlated to previous data points. But assuming we do a careful job with our design, this is really a design issue more than it is a statistical issue, making sure that we have independence of observations. And I believe that this is really, of all these five bullets here, this is the one that's easiest to achieve just as long as we take care not to have overlap with either sampling mechanism or with our measurement to have independence of observations. Next is that the data can be fit with a linear model. Now that certainly is clear for us when we have simple linear regression. What about when we have multiple linear regression? Well, I'm going to show you two approaches to this. One that is a quick and easy approach and one that's a little bit more difficult, but neither of these are, are too difficult. So let me call up a... Um, let me see if I can call up here a little notepad. And in this little notepad here, uh, in the simple linear regression case, what we did is we looked at our explanatory variable and our response variable, and we wanted to make sure that any relationship that we see there uh, 
indeed looks linear. You could put a, a, a line through those points as opposed to a relationship that in fact does exist, but perhaps is something more in which a curve would fit through the points. So we're doing multiple regression with the anticipation that we have this linear relationship. But what does it mean when we talk about having a linear relationship and you have multiple explanatory variables? Well, the first and most straightforward way, and probably actually the best way to check for a linear relationship, is to check for a linear relationship of each of these explanatory variables. So we'll look to see if it's reasonable to assume a linear relationship for x1. We'll look to see if it's reasonable to assume a linear relationship for x2 and so forth. So if you think back to what I did originally with our plots here, that would be like looking for a linear relationship in each of the plots in this matrix. That's hard to see really in this matrix, which would be another argument for going ahead and creating individual scatter plots, at least with each of the explanatory variables here, hospital beds, income, density, with physicians. Now I like to look at the relationships also of each of the individual explanatory variables because it does give me information. You may recall that I started talking about how density doesn't seem to be related. This one here doesn't seem to be related if you look down this column with any of these variables, either explanatory or response variables. And as a consequence of that, I kind of predicted how density would play into our model. But at least for the physicians looking at physicians related to hospital beds, income, density. We could actually, if we wanted to, create individual scatter plots of the nature that I was just showing you right here. So that's method one. The second method is a little bit easier and is commonly used in multiple regression. And so I'd like to show you that method and take a look at that method. So I'm gonna go ahead and call back up my um, notebook that I'm working on. And I'm gonna create a code chunk down here. And in this code chunk, I am going to uh, paste in, I'm going to paste in a little command here. And let's look at what I'm actually creating in this code chunk. Let me go ahead and run all the code chunks up to this point. That's this little down arrow with a green bar underneath it. So I'm going to go ahead and run that. And now I'm going to run this code that I just pasted in here. Let's take a look at what this actually is. It's a scatter plot. You can see the word plot. So it's a scatter plot. And notice what we're using for the x axis are our fitted values. Now, if you remember, what fitted values are is what, that's the name that R gives for our predictions. That's our Y hats. So our predicted values will be on the X axis and our residuals will be on the Y axis. This is often referred to as a residual fit plot. And this is the way it looks. So we have our residuals on one axis are fitted values on the other axis. So remember our fitted values here would be our predicted values for the number of physicians for each of the cities based upon the number of hospital beds and income. Notice that's the model that I'm using here, the beds income model. I'm no longer using density in this. And so in this beds income model, these would be our predicted values. And then for each one of our predicted values, you of course have a residual, the actual value minus the predicted value. And so if I were to take this first point here, 
we're predicting about 80 physicians, but we're a little bit off, not much, because if the residual was zero, our prediction and observation would align exactly. The prediction here is a little bit off because it's a little bit under zero. So we predict it actually a um, one value that when we took y, the observed, minus the predicted, we get y minus predicted, we get a negative number, which means the predicted was a little bit higher than what we actually observed. And so we ended up with a negative residual. Our observation was under what we predicted. So this residual fit plot, now how does that play into linearity? Well, to help even further with this, I'm gonna add one more little function here and I'm going to put in an AB line. You might recall that's how we put in regression lines, except that instead of putting in a regression line, I'm going to put in a line that is a zero, zero. That is, I'm putting in a horizontal line. Now that's gonna make it easier to look for what we're trying to look for. And that is, do these points appear to be more or less randomly scattered about that line, or does it appear that the points are actually forming some sort of trend that is detectable that is not along this line? So I would like to see random scatter of residuals. That's unlike when I look at my observed scores and my predicted scores in which I want to actually see, or my observed and my um, explanatory variables in which I actually want to see a pattern. Here I don't want to see a pattern. The, the thing to most often watch for is when you notice maybe on one side the points all are above the line and then they come down maybe below the line and then they go back up and so you get this sort of curvilinear pattern. That is what the residuals are going to look like if you have in any one or more of your variables a nonlinear pattern. Remember that when we're looking at predicted values here, that their base, those fitted values here, are based upon two explanatory variables in this instance. Uh, if you had a bigger regression model, it might be five or six. So you've really created one observation, one prediction based upon a number of explanatory variables and similarly, one residual based upon a number of explanatory variables for each point, for each observation that you make. And so um, this is combining the information from all of the explanatory variables, and we're looking to see if there's a nonlinear relationship in any of them. And if there is in any of them, then we would expect to see something other than a random pattern. What I'm seeing right now is a, a fairly random looking pattern about this horizontal line. I don't see any trend going up over here on the left and then up again on the right and down in the middle. I don't see that. Now, you might say, well, it's hard for me to know what that means. It really takes experience. And I will tell you when I teach multiple regression that what I find students who are just starting out with it uh, will do more often than I will is they'll start to think they see patterns there that I don't necessarily see. And the reason that it's easy to start thinking you're seeing patterns is because we're talking about a sample of data and that sample varies from, from sample to sample to sample. And so whereas I'm looking for something that's a real clear detectable pattern, often students are trying to see if they can kind of see any pattern at all in the data. So I don't really see one here. So whereas the individual scatter plots would tell us where the non-linearity is occurring. This would just tell us if there's any non-linear relationship. And if there is a pattern like this, where I call it a pattern, which is really the absence of a pattern, when it's like this, then you actually can feel quite comfortable that you are good to go with all of the explanatory variables that you're using. So I feel pretty decent about this. Now, the next thing, let's go ahead and call back up my little slide here. The next thing is, after we check that the data can be fit with a linear model, 
is whether the variability of errors is homoscedastic. What is homoscedastic? Homoscedastic means that the variability of our response measure is the same all the way across each of our explanatory measures. But now we have multiple explanatory variables. So how do we deal with that? Well, I've got good news for you. We deal with it in the same way, with the exact same plot. We come across here with the fitted values that are really a representation that is formed from all of the covariates. And then we look at the residuals. And what we're looking at he for here is whether you could imagine a tunnel that all these points fit into using horizontal lines. So now down here in the bottom, that's pretty easy to do because we have the axis, okay? Up here on the top, if I exclude that one point, I could pretty much fit a horizontal line right here. Now, that's as opposed to having a, an effect where the points fit into, let me show you a picture again. It would be easier than describing it. That's as opposed to if you were to get a picture that looks something more like this. So here I'll put my horizontal line. We have our residuals here. Um, and we have our fitted values here. And imagine that it looked kind of like this. And notice what's happening as we go along. What's happening as we go along is we're creating this broadening effect. What does that tell me? That tells me that as I increase my prediction, I'm getting an increase in variability. As I increase my prediction, I'm getting an increase in variability. And so this, if I had a picture like this, it would tell me that I have a heteroscedastic uh, situation. And that's not good. Um, I'm going to hold off telling you why that's not good. I'm going to go through the reason for all of these conditions for valid inference in the next video. But right now, we're just seeing how to detect it. Similarly, we could go the other way. We could have higher variance here for lower fit values, and then it gets lower and lower and lower and lower and lower. And then you get this sort of thing, where really what we're hoping for is that when you create this plot of residual fit, that you really have this sort of horizontal tunneling effect. Now, this one isn't perfect. Um, I do have, notice here down here, I have these points without points up here. Notice I have this one up here all by itself, which to me is more indicative of an, of an outlier than anything else. And remember, outliers can be influential. Uh, but in the main, it doesn't look too bad. And again, don't try to read too much into it. We're using a sample of cities. And if we took another sample of small cities, uh, we're going to get different, uh, different information. So I'm, I'm really looking to see if there's a real detectable pattern there. I start to feel that way on this side because it's small variance and then it gets over here large. But I don't know that that's a lot going on because I still have this point up here giving me uh, down here around a fitted value of 90, giving me more um, variation. The other thing about this is that the variation is assumed to occur at any fitted value, but notice that at any fitted value, you might only have one or two points. So one way that you can do this that I think makes it a little bit easier, let me go back to my picture here, is to almost think of these in groupings. Think of these in groupings so that you get more points together in a grouping. And if you do that, if I think of a grouping that, let's say I drew a line here, then I've got that kind of variation. If I draw a line there, then I've got that kind of variation. If I draw a line right here, then again I have. And if I draw a line here, similar, maybe a little bit more, but similar variation. So does, hopefully that makes sense. And I, the only reason I'm putting those groupings in is because it really helps us understand variation for our different fit values when we indeed only have one or two residuals for every single fit value.
um, and many fit values, I, when I say every single, I mean every single one we have, many of the fit values here are not represented by any points. Okay, I can pick lots of places here where if I picked a fit value, I can shoot up through and not hit any of these points because there's not really a fit value there. 